Okay, we're ready to start the final lecture. How then should we do science? Well, the first thing that suggests itself in the title itself is that we consider the full meaning of the word science. Remember, uh, science we found is bigger than the modern meaning. We found that science or philosophy can be used in a wide sense. It includes all knowledge and the original root of both words. The science of the first principle of all things we call philosophy in, in the narrow sense. And it precedes modern science, and you, you will implicitly use it even when you don't um, acknowledge it consciously. We should be cognizant of this science before science. That's the first thing we learn about how we should do science, keeping sciences in their proper place. So this science before science is what we've been going through chapter by chapter, lecture by lecture. So let's see chapter by chapter what we've discovered. In chapter one and two, we saw that science is central to our cultural thinking and acting. And we identified improper knowledge as a species of belief that's very prevalent in our minds, though we don't realize it. It's a species of blind faith. Actually, we saw that people believe that the earth goes around the sun without realizing that it's a belief. Because, uh, we, sh that we also uh, realize that proper knowledge has to be from direct conclusions that come from uh, direct sensorial knowledges and or reasoning that we have done on our own. We saw that um, having a blind faith and not recognizing it that we're actually taking things from our cultural milieu can narrow one's world view. And further, we, we saw, um, as we brung, brought this to completion in later chapters, that the unawareness of the source of these beliefs and recognize them, recognizing them as beliefs um, can cause us to be blind um, as the culture might change. And if it changes in a way that could harm science, we won't recognize it because we won't recognize that we're getting these things where we're getting these things from. We'll just accept them like the frog in the, in the boiling water, in the water that gradually comes to a boil. There's evidence that this is happening now. In the Journal of Physics Today for Physicists in the June 2002 issue, so very recently, um, there was an, a scientist trying to respond to what he perceives as an attack against science and the way he responded by saying that science is not goal-directed, that it's not concerned and progressing towards truth, which is, of course, a great way of undermining, the best way of undermining science. Because if scientists ever come to really believe that science is not about truth, the whole reason for doing it will evaporate. This is what happens when you forget the science before science. You still do it, you just do it badly. You do it unconsciously. In chapter three, we found that sensorial knowledge comes first for us, and that we must put first things first, grounding our knowledge in what we know, certainly, gradually moving out to what we know less certainly. We have found that physical things are, we call that form, but can be other than they are, potentiality or matter. Because they change. Physica, we found, is a study of changeable being. Sensorial knowledge is a real form of knowledge. It's my awareness of this coldness of the glass that is not the physical change of my hand cooling down or the water warming up. It is something other than that. It's my acquiring the coldness of this particular glass as that form without losing myself. We found that the senses are reliable, yet they have positive and negative limits. But in the end, the senses are the ultimate source of figuring out what these limits are. We saw if we forget the prim primacy of the senses, we can end up like my student Bill, thinking that reality is not real. We can despair the existence of the world and end as philosophical idealists that think we only know what's in our head. Again, so much for science if we think the world does not exist, because the modern sciences are studying the world. 
in the end, Descartes and Kant are philosophical idealists because they forget how we know things. We know things through the senses. We must keep first things first. Chapter 4, we found that um, more consequences of the, of the Kantian thinking that natural results from our modern imperial metric mindset. And this actually led people early in the uh, 20th century to think that we could prove a system ideas of, of ideas is true and have everything locked up in our heads. And they were profoundly disappointed when Godel, who was one of these people who believed this, proved that is, that's impossible. These people were profoundly devastated. Those who took the imperial metric as a sole guide also um, co-reigned, and they also were um, dismayed by this proof that you cannot even prove the consistency of a system within that system. And this le led humanities people, who didn't really understand the science, but thought they were making use of it, to make statements like, does it contain, this is David Hume, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matters of fact and existence? No. Commit it to the flames. Of course, this is absurd because it's self-condemning, -con it's self-refuting. Because does this contain any reasoning with respect to number or quantity? Where is the experimental science in that statement? The first victim of Hume is David Hume. Godel proved that one could not even prove within a system of ideas that the system is consistent, which means everything is called into doubt within the system if all you have is it. Only those who conceive man after the matter of an angel, thinking man has innate ideas instead of getting his ideas from the senses, will be saddened by Godel's theorem. In fact, we saw that we abstract our ideas from phantasms. Jude Doherty points out in a succinct way, more is given in the sense report of reality than the senses are able to appreciate. We learned that ideas are that by which we know things, not that which we know. So when we talk of an object, we should remember that when we're thinking of that object, there is a that by which we know. There is an idea of that object. It is the idea that puts us in contact with the thing. We further saw ideas of things like that of a circle are general, so they cannot be material because material is something specific. Material things are specific things, but can be other things. Ideas present to us general things, and ideas cannot be anything but what they are. For example, take the idea of a nut-bolt fastener. This idea is, presents to us uh, um, the idea of a nut-bolt fastener, and, and where you have, you know, uh, bolt that has its respective nut that screws onto it. Now, if I just think in my imagination, I can wipe away all the nuts in the universe. And I can think, well, see, I've split the idea. But you haven't split the idea because the bolt implicitly calls for the nuts by, by the thread that's on it. It implicitly calls for the other half. So if I take, really take away that part, I've abandoned the idea that of the nut bolt fastener, and I've um, went to a different idea, whatever that might be. But when you have, when you have um, split the idea in half, you no longer have the idea. If I just truly had a nut with no threads on it, then it's not a part of a nut bolt fastener. It's not a nut bolt fastener at all. You've left that idea. You've went on to something else. So. We, we saw the immateriality of the intellect because of the general nature of ideas and the specific nature of material things. We noted that immaterial again meaning not material. We noted that many of our ideas present objects that have no sensible aspects of all, at all. Justice, for example, has no color, weight, height, width, or other material properties. Ideas have no extension. We said you cannot have half of a principle. Since quantity is the first accident, the first property of material changeable being, that is what makes them um, 
As a matter of fact, that is what makes them changeable because of the fact that we said that the apple, part of the apple is on this side and part of it is on this side. I can cut it in half and I can have two halves of an apple. That's um, what allows them to be changeable. Unlike the material things, which, I mean, immaterial things which would be on top of each other, um, cannot be on top of each other. We said that the baseball bat hitting the baseball cannot, pushes it because they, were not, they cannot be on top of each other. The material thing is extended, and so it does not allow one thing to be on top of another. Whereas immaterial things like an idea, the idea of the apple and it, redness can be put on top of each other in your mind because there's no extension. From this, we re um, necessarily concluded that the intellect and hence the substantial form of man was immaterial, not material. If one thinks ideas are all he knows, then we said he's trapped in his mind, no contact with reality. Modern science takes for granted that ideas are that by which we know. Denying we can know truth, i.e. that we can conform the mind to the world, is hard to fathom, indeed. Nietzsche tried the is, this is no truth experiment, and we'll see, I'll tell you in a second what happened, but many claim today to try this experiment, that there is no truth. But of course, when their pet parts of reality are coming into play, they defend them as real. And so they don't really do the experiment. It's sort of a game that they sometimes talk about and often and mostly don't do, but only do in areas where they don't like that particular reality. Nietzsche, on the other hand, really tried the experiment and lost his sanity. In fact, he had really lost the battle when he tried to entertain the idea that there's no such thing as truth. We saw in chapter four also that being is primary and that it's multi-leveled, not univocal. We cannot write a sentence without an implicit reference to being. We said that being, even beings of reason, are founded in the real. Everything that we have in our minds comes from the real. Truth was the central topic of chapter four. All things, insofar as they are, are intelligible. And we said that intelligibility is being looked at from the standpoint of understanding. The essence of a thing is made present again by the idea of the thing. Intelligibility of the thing is freed by our intellect from the existing thing, which is a form matter composite. We have a form matter composite. We're able, able to abstract the substantial form and become united with a substantial form. We become in an intentional world of existence the thing, the form of the thing as its form. The intellect forms an idea by which it becomes the thing, is conformed to the thing. If we deny this conformity of the mind with the thing, we should keep in mind, if we deny this, then we've become part of the anti-truth war of Friedrich Nietzsche. Thinking is a multi-step process, we, we learned. We first abstract the idea, then you can make judgments go by referring back to this sensorial knowledge about whether thing, what things exist and how they exist and so forth, and learn more about the essence of the thing, because we said the initial thing you learn about it when you, is that it exists, and in a vague way, what it is. But we have to hone in on what that essence is. And we do that by a reasoning process, where we look at propositions together and look for commonalities among things, and draw analogies so we can come to conclusions. And analogies, remember, were the real proportionality of being as opposed to a metaphor. And we, we notice that this process of doing this is usually an implicit and spontaneous process. People are known to have common sense when they do this process sort of underground very well and have integrated, well, been well integrated and have lived the virtues. They spontaneously do this. Philosophy tests and make rigorous these conclusions of common sense because if you don't bring it to the rigor, what can happen is you can make mistakes and not be aware of it. Two ways of um, looking for commonality I should note. One is to take a sort of average, the rough way of scientific knowledge, you just sort of, of infra-scientific knowledge, just sort of looking around, see what, 
this kind of thing tends to have that and this and the other thing. But the scientific way, scientific in the general sense, wide sense, is to look for the, calm, the formal cause um, and really see what the essence of the thing is. Something that you happen to see a lot, and an example of some uh, particular thing, uh, like if you mostly see red apples, you might come to the conclusion that all apples have to be red. That would be a false conclusion based on this sort of averaging process rather than trying to look at what the essence of an apple is. Too many settle for the first without ever recognizing the existence of the second. We're called to recognize the existence of the second and do it to the, and integrate it to the degree that we are able in our respective vocations. We used our new understanding to delve into the nature of animals, men, and robots in chapter 5. We saw that animals have sensorial knowledge and nutritive life. Man, in addition, has a rational life, the life of the intellect. Robots, we saw, are imitations, functional imitations, that don't even have nutritive life. They're just imitations. And we make, we make them to be imitations. That's what we mean by a robot. The specialized sciences we found needed these conclusions to keep themselves from erring and, and um, to even in some cases to actually do the things that they do do. In psychology uh, of animals and men, one needs these, for example, to know that animals have sensorial knowledge and intellect, and man has intellectual knowledge to avoid huge errors in understanding and interpreting imperial logical data. A lot of mistakes are made in animal psychology by not knowing this distinction between intellectual and sensorial knowledge. Just sort of vaguely talking about man and animals and not honing in on what, what's what. In cybernetics, one needs these conclusions to pre prevent widely erroneous conclusions about artificial life and intelligence. Um, specialized sciences need these conclusions also in an indirect way. For example, if a man is not qualitatively different from a robot, how can you go around, how can you justify going around making robots? Because you're making slaves if he's the same, qualitatively the same as a man. Indeed, how can you study and eat animals? Of course, this reverses itself as well, because really what you're doing by not recognizing the intellect is, by, is lowering man rather than raising the animals. And sooner or later, this will come back to the conclusion, why not eat people? Why not study people? Indeed, without recognizing the distinction, we lower man's status. So, why not do therapeutic cloning, for example? This, or, and, you know, even more obvious things, why not um, study unhealthy men that just you just don't feel are useful enough in society, for example? These distinctions are important in, in, in this indirect way of how you do the science. This latter thinking may not destroy the science, but it sure as heck is going to make it not very worthwhile to do the science and actually counterproductive. And then in chapter 6, we saw the table of the sciences. We put all the sciences in their proper place, and we saw in a nice chart how all knowledge is organized. And it, had, it has its organization with respect to us because of our nature. So it's an organization... Uh, that comes about because the way we learn, the way our, our natures are. And we put each science in its proper place, and we found that the pure sciences, the top-level sciences, uh, the study of truth is truth, and that that divided according to the lines of the three degrees of abstraction. The first degree being the least, uh, being just leaving behind particular matter, but keeping general matter, was this gave us the study of changeable being, Mathematica, which is the study of being as quantitative, where, we, where we, only, we consider those things that can exist, that can only exist in matter, but be con conceived of in the mind without matter. Metaphysical is the study of being as being the highest level that St. Thomas calls separation. Applied sciences then was the next level science where we study truth as lived. We talked about the highest element in this, morality or ethics, in the last chapter. In the methodological sciences, we studied the human, tru uh, 
truths, tools for obtaining truth, logic, linguistics, dialectics, and so on. Each specialized science learns its limits and locates the source of its first principles in this chapter. Without an awareness of the divisions and limits, one inevitably limits one's view to a narrow swath of the world and simultaneously, hopelessly confuses all the different domains. In particular, scientists can start to think the whole world is empirological. That is, they can start to believe that the world is only empirical data and the logical constructs that you make to coordinate this data. This is picked up by non-scientists and carried much further than a scientist who has a self-correcting method of his field as well as the experience in the experimental part of his science of being in contact with reality and knowing what happens, for example, like my student whose capacitor blew up on him. Those sorts of things confront you with the world very quickly in a very obvious way. But non-scientists don't have this direct contact and they can take the conclusions of the scientist in a way more seriously than the, non -sci than the scientist ever would. And they pick it up and they can force the culture more quickly into um, philosophical idealism. And this is what's happened over the centuries, actually. Modern physics now is largely imper imperial metric, we found. And it's uh, actually a mixed science. Studies the material things as quantitative in that second level of abstraction called Mathematica. Formally mathematical, I mean, formally, formally mathematical, materially physical. Without this understanding, physics would tend towards one of so it do tend toward, in actual fact, what you'll find is in talking to physicists, experimentalists, those that do the experiments in the lab, tend to be materialists, not believing in the material. Whereas theorists, those who sit and study the equations, there is this split, by the way, lots of non-physicists don't realize this. There's these two separate fields in general. I myself am rare in having contributed to both of these, but mostly people are in one category or the other. This category tends to be Platonist, tending to um, think uh, only the only reality is the immaterial. So this, will, this, of course, will remain a vague set of notion resolved only by the implicit realism of the scientist. And that implicit realism, of course, is uh, uh, nothing but the realism of St. Thomas and Aristotle, but it's implicit, not brought out, not brought to the surface, so it, it's not congealed enough to be a force of order. And he will continue to bring in the imperiological when he's doing his thinking on these things, and this will kind of make a mixed soup out of his philosophy. And in fact, what will happen is be, by this being implicit rather than explicit, the explicit thing that he will do the most of is be the imperiological, and he will end by making his imperiological the ultimate end of his search. Uh, as I said, that scientists may live without too much damage as long as the culture doesn't get too bad with, to himself and others, but cultural norms, the area of this thinking will be let loose on those who really take it seriously, and the, event, the or error will then eventually come home to the scientist when somebody comes knocking on his door and he doesn't know the answer to the questions because it actually sprung originally from the scientist himself taking the imperiological as the ultimate end. Indeed, we've seen that a healthy culture, one imbued with truth, is necessary to have healthy science. We depend heavily on our improper knowledge, the knowledge that we get from others, the truth that others tell us that we have to take on trust of their authority and understanding is necessary for the growth of knowledge. We can't figure out everything by ourselves. If a, a culture feeds us lies, it's very easy for the individuals in that culture to become cynical about their powers of knowing. We also saw an anti-Catholic prejudice uh, hid in the culture saying that Catholicism had stifled science when the exact opposite is the case. Um, we found that Galileo, we noted that Galileo was no less a Catholic and a Catholic menu than his predecessors on whose work he stood and, and was able to do what he, what he did by 
their thought, as well as the technology that they had given them. The Middle Ages were the first to actually invent these things and put them into the culture and use them. Eyeglasses, clocks, plows, printing presses. These were um, even gunpowder, though, though first invented in China, was only really used in a continual way by a culture where it didn't get this stillbirth and get stopped in um, Catholic Europe and the seeded cultures, cultures seeded by Catholic Europe. And so really the, the process here we found was more like boiling water. You, turn, you start it off and you warm it up slowly. So through the beginning with the uh, year 1000 at the, at the end of the barbarian invasions where Europe was finally getting to come together, um, this imp material impediment was wiped away and Europe was finally becoming a political unity again and so some culture could begin to thrive, right from that point the water was starting to, was started to be heated and it was gradually heated till it came to a boil in the, with, in, at least in the imperial metric with Newton. Again we lean on this cultural inheritance, it keeps us from following the logic of our erroneous principles. But the effect of this very inertia can lull us into a false sense of security and not be as sensitive to first principles as we should be and sooner or later be like that frog who doesn't know, who realizes too late what's happening. So we can overestimate the imperiological and we saw the results of taking the imperiological science as a mode for all thinking as if it were the first philosophy, or the first science. Uh, we did that with several examples. By taking the imperiological as a fundamental or only science, one is adopting the perfect philosophy for this realm, this beings of reason land within your mind, and that's Kant's philosophy. Kant created this philosophy to give Newtonian imperial metric physics a certainty it did not have. And so Kant ended in a sort of lived Godel's theorem, denying that we could know everything, that we, that we could know anything, leaving in the end, no basis for Newtonian physics. By contrast, we saw his precursors, uh, Newton and Galileo, used Thomistic principles that were in the air, that flowed from the Catholic culture of Europe. In particular, we identified four principles that are still in the air, even in the most atheistic parts of those Catholic seated cultures. And that is that the world exists independent of us and is orderly, that we can understand it, the world is good, and thus we should have no aversion to experiment. And the world is not necessary. Now, these are still really fairly ingrained in our cultural understanding. It may be hard to fathom that most cultures, and, and, and a matter of fact, no other culture besides the Catholic culture had these, all these understandings. It's hard for us to believe that, but this is because of this improper knowledge we've been handed down. Galileo and Newton were driven often incohately by Thomistic principles. They were both educated in Thomistic principles. But, but you can even note, though, this education in Newtonian statement, in Newton's statement in the Principia, <clears throat> where he brings this out explicitly, showing that he understood the Aristotelian distinctions. For, in here he says, he says, in the Principia, I think it's page six or something, for here I designed to give a mathematical notion of these forces without considering their physical causes and seats. He's saying I'm doing imperial metric science. Despite these warnings of Newton, we saw that there were those who deny inertia needs a cause. We saw that the key concept of inertia, which is the, the, the next level principle of physica, the most important one after the base sort of fundamental ones that were discovered, and um, these people in the Middle Ages and even um, John Philoponus, before the, uh, the, the sort of uh, breakdown of culture because coming from the fall of Rome and the barbarian invasions, that, um, that he had identified these ideas. And they, why did they surpass Aristotle? Because they culturally were free to think the world as non-necessary. So they didn't have these impinging forces uh, acting on them that Aristotle did. They were also able to think of the universe as a whole. 
we saw that this part of the cultural milieu fell into disuse with, New with after Newton, not Newton himself, but after Newton, when Kant said that the um, uh, universe is a bad concept, not usable, unintelligible, absurd. We saw multiple irrational positions that can be held if one does not remember the nature of the imperial metric. And this part we didn't discuss explicitly in the lectures, but it's in the book. Quantum mechanics um, can be used via Bell's theorem to say that the world does not exist when you're not looking at it. And this is the source of the famed controversy you may have heard of between Einstein and Bohr. And this is still a major thing that you will hear physicists saying, is that the world comes into existence when you measure it. This comes from this taking of the imperial metric as a philosophy and not recognizing its place. And we should say with Gilson, the, the great Thomist of the, er, of the early part of the uh, 20th century, and early and middle, what he said of metaphysics can also be said of the science of changeable being. That is, don't pose questions to metaphysics, in our case, physica, if you don't want answers from it. And that's the key thing, is what often happens is people will pose questions, they will try to answer, answer them modern, with modern science, instead of trying to answer them with their proper sphere of answer. If it's a metaphysical question, it should be answered by metaphysics. If it's a physica question, it should be answered by physica. Of course, we're all human, so we'll all seek those answers. It's just how we'll, whether we'll get them in a true way or in a false way. And if, we, if they're false, they're going to end up compounding themselves over time if we don't correct them soon. Little errors in the beginning lead to large errors later on. Neglecting the wider physics can, can lead to statements like that about Alan Guth's theory. Alan Guth is the one who came up with the newest theory of the the quantitative interrelations of the universe, and it's called the inflationary scenario. And he was featured in, in a Discovery magazine not too long ago, and the writer there says, the entire universe burst into, and he claims this is what Guth is saying, the entire universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. Something from nothing? That's nonsense. Now, he didn't mean that it came from God. We've already showed that you cannot prove, because matter is indestructible, prime matter is indestructible, you cannot prove the creation of the universe. He's talking about literally nothing turning into something. And that is impossible. Again, we saw the reason you can think that it's possible is because you start to think of nothing as a thing, forgetting that it is a being of reason and cannot exist outside your mind. And the analogy we used was with light and dark. Light is the thing, dark is the being of reason, the absence of light. We also saw that the Big Bang doesn't prove creation. It just gives an indication, a strong indication, that God probably created the universe at that point. But it's not a proof. Um, we gave some examples. We called error is not something of itself. It is only something with respect to the truth that it distorts. Error is a being of reason. So we need, uh, it needs all kinds of, error needs all kinds of convoluted statements to maintain itself. It needs to depend on truth. It leans on truth in order to exist in the way it exists. And that is by perverting something that is. So, in the truest sense, it, it doesn't, it, error is an absence, not an existence. More than pointing to error is showing how to, uh, um, how to begin, the, we showed how to begin the task of reaching the being that's revealed by the stable relations that the imperiological sciences, the modern sciences main mode reveals. We clarified the distinction between the imperial metric and the properly explanatory, which gets not just the quantitative interrelations of things coordinated by beings of reasons, but ask the question of what things are. What is that? What is the essence? That's what ontology does. That's what the, the bottom line question that you're asking anyway. And the tool that you use is the imperial metric science. Specifically, we revealed uh, 
what one might say about the real essence of things using some key modern scientific discoveries. We did that, remember, with six different areas. In the lectures, we cut out a few. We took inertia, we took Big Bang Theory, evolution, uh, and special relativity, relativity of motion, and we examined them and showed how many ways you can go wrong if you take the periometric as simply representing ontology. ontology. Chapter 8, we moved uh, to discuss God because he was introduced multiple times as uh, being called for to explain certain things in the imperial metric theories we were trying to understand. But we had never, uh, we had only proved his existence in a sketch of the fourth proof that we, we saw in this chapter. And this chapter we went and we went into detail and looked at the five proofs. We found that he is the source of all being, pure act. He is who is. We found that if we deny his existence, we implicitly deny reason itself. It's a, uh, the touchstones of sanity must be denied in order to deny his existence. Understanding the proofs also shed light um, on the issues of the previous chapters and, and expanded their zone of applicability. It brought to the fore the importance of first principles and the science of first principles, metaphysics. Again, um, one will try as the chess traditionalists I talk about in the book, how you could imagine a group of men who were so enamored by chess that they uh, form a group and they become so good at chess that they only play chess with each other. And furthermore, they pass this heritage on and it becomes a heritage of centuries. And we, we ask the question, what kind of thinking would these people have if their whole lives were chess and their, all their traditions were chess? They would start thinking the world, of the world in terms of beings of reason created around chess. And one example I gave is um, if you ask him to explain how a rock falls, he might uh, first not care. But later he might say, well, it's kind of like a pond. It's the same as the rule of a pond going one square forward. And he would be, the thing that would shock you is that he would be totally satisfied with this explanation because he's confined to the being, world of beings of reason. This is the state that we find a lot of modern science and are, as a result, that culture driven by that science. And so we find Goth, Alan Guth, remember the discoverer of the inflationary model, that replaces the Big Bang model. It's saying, where do the laws of phys physics come from? We are a long way from answering that, as if you could answer that within the imperial metric scheme. Metaphysics is the first philosophy. philosophy. By it, we grasp the intelligible reality in things at their core, necessary principles that are applicable to all things. Being we saw in a more clear way, we, again we saw it in chapter 4, just like we saw the proof that was the proof of the existence of God, that it was a valid proof, it was a sketch, so we would not expect a neophyte to be able to completely grasp it, only to get the general trend of it. But in this chapter, we, we, you should be able to see the necessity of these things and at an ever more deeper level as you meditate on them. But here we also deepened our knowledge of the transcendentals, the good, the one, the true, In chapter 9, we discussed moral thinking. We found that uh, we should, what we should do is based in accordance with our nature and what our place in that overall scheme is. We found that God is our ultimate end. And if truth being himself is not our end, including implicitly, then to the degree that he is not, an element of disorder, of nothing, enters our lives. And... Um, we create havoc for ourselves and others. The natural result of modern science deprived of this aspect of this before of modern science is that imperiological science becomes our ultimate end. It becomes our God. And what happens if we deny our last end? We replace it with imperiological science? Recall that the narrow field of imperiometric science is not a standalone, it's a tool. So what we've done is we've made people 
a tool for a tool. Where he decided that the end is imperiological science, a tool. So the people are a tool for that tool. But remember, we've left out what the tool is for, so it's a tool for a tool that is deprived of what it's meant to build, which is physica, and then ultimately understanding of metaphysica. Thus, the necessary result of leaving God out, even implicitly leaving him out, is that people become mere means for the ends of the powerful. They are thus deprived of their dignity as human beings. Again, even though you might not take this logic seriously to the end, it remains true that the consequences are implicitly in what you're saying. You may say X, but not act on X, but that doesn't take away the fact that implicitly in that statement X is contained whatever consequences are contained. And the consequence of denying your last end being God is that uh, the man is reduced to being a tool of a tool without its proper end. We found in, uh, also the place of the modern sciences. Modern sciences, for the most part, the one place left, we, we can note, where truth is really respected our, in our society. If a scientist says something, people will say, well, that's true. If practically anyone else says some, something, I mean, when he's speaking about his science, if practically anyone else says something, we'll say that's his opinion. So, in short, um, whenever it, the scientist is humbly working to understand reality, sci he's defending truth. Science is defending truth. It's a shame if this important defense of truth is lost because of it attempting to give this uh, science, this imperial metric tool, more and greater importance than it has. It would be a shame to lose that good thing because we try to give it more importance than it, than it should be given. Similarly, we should not let the methodological sciences, for example, poetry, literature, language arts, and many, most social studies fields now, the way they practice, which are legitimately concerned with the subjective elements and how you communicate with each other and so on. That's, after all, what the methodological sciences are about. The tools of knowing, including how we know from each other. But they should not be given more than their due by allowing them to eclipse the pure sciences and the applied sciences. Of course, we're speaking the intended, extended sense. Pure science, truth is truth. Applied science, truth is lived. Methodological sciences only exist to serve pure science. The applied sciences uh, also need me the methodological sciences. Ethics, for example, the applied science of ethics, the top-level science of, of the, in the applied category, needs literature to give food to the imagination to aid one in living as one should. Um, again, physica needs literature to transmit the beauty and the interest of science, including modern science. If you read a good science fiction novel, it communicates the interest of or a good science fiction movie, for that matter, communicates the interest of science and why, why one should do science in a way that's amenable to the imagination, which is, which again, as we saw in, chap in earlier chapters, a part of the way our intelligence works. In short, the work of all the sciences should be put in their proper place and their proper order. So we need to do more placement here, and we learned how to do it in chapter 9 and the, and the ones before it. We should note that those with a traditional bent, who are few indeed today, should remember that the real advances that modern science has made are good, and we should resolve to new, lose neither the new methods that they brought about, nor the new findings, but to value them and put them in their proper place. Those with a modern bent should note and remember that many severe problems accompany modern science when it loses its proper setting. How then should we do modern science? Now we're going to specify, we've kind of answered the, the how then should we do science in the broad sense. Let's specify to the modern sciences. We should keep in mind that physica is larger than the modern sciences. Physica is part of the larger tree. Some of these fields need physicas. Um, so, so when you have a result, 
in an imperial metric science, you should come back and look at it from the broader physica and try to understand what it means, what the, what the real being that's causing the things that you're seeing in your into your imperial metric science. And um, we found that uh, many the uh, physica's results are needed by other sciences, like metaphysics uses some of the results from physica. So all the sciences are interrelated. We should also remember that being is primary. That's the first thing we know, and it's the thing that we are really trying to, um, the ocean that we're trying to dive in and explore. Knowledge, and then the most important thing um, to remember is that keeping first things first is knowledge is about reality. Knowledge is about reality, not about knowledge. How do philosophical insights change by and um, change how we do modern science? So all the things that we said, how does this make us do our labs different or our teaching of physics and chemistry and biology and how we actually do chemistry and biology and physics? Well, they just require a broadening to some degree. We need to re replace the current impl implicit philosophical um, things that are done with an explicit sound philosophical one. We noted that we're human, so we're going to always philosophize. It's just, are we going to do it consciously or unconsciously? Rigorously or inrigorously? And then there's really two aspects here. The methodology, how is it, so there's two sub-questions in the larger question of how does it change how we do science. One is, does it change the methodology? The other is, does it change the interpretation? Well, the methodology um, probably isn't changed a whole bunch, except in the moral realm. Once you include the science before science, you realize that there are certain orders of things that you can't do whatever you want to get your experiment done. And you can't do whatever experiment you want just because it, it sounds interesting. But the methodologies are kind of, we've noted before, are self-correcting, and most of the methodologies are going to stand pretty much unchanged. And um, putting one's proper final end in place does, not, does mean that some will have to make profound changes. Correct understanding will also keep one clear about what belongs to the imperial metric theory and what doesn't. So it'll help you in creating an imperial metric theory because you'll not feel like you have to make it ontological because you're make, this is a tool that you're using to then, that you're going to come back and look at the ontology. Uh, but what it will do is help in teaching the methodology because students will no longer have the natural impediments to understanding uh, certain imperiometric ideas because they'll be seen in their proper light and they won't look like they're contradicting their common sense. And finally, in, in the great upheavals where you shift from one paradigm to another, for example, when you go from Newtonian physics to uh, general relativity, Einstein's theory, where you had... Uh, great what they call paradigm shift, which of course we now recognize is um, the reason it's a big shift is because people are taking the Newtonian imperiometric physics as directly ontological, and they're saying, well look, this is what the world is, and then they're taking the Einstein theory and saying, well look, this is what the world is, well look, they're totally different. So we won't have this giant feeling of a shift, but when, when the imperiometric theory does change and, and get incorporated into a larger quantitative theory, for, is, which is really what happened with Einstein's theory, sound philosophy may help us. Well, first it will help us in that, keep our sanity, so that we won't feel like the whole world is falling out from underneath us. But it may help us actually in the methodology because it help, may help us see which direction the new paradigm has to take. Now, by contrast, the, we, we talked about the methodology, how it will change. The interpretation will change drastically. The explicit philosophical underpinning greatly change what, changes how you interpret that, the theory. We must not stop when the theory is complete. We must explicitly try and understand what it suggests about what's underneath the theory. Once the tool is made, we must be yielding, willing to use it. The tool is made for building. We should use the theory. We, as much as we can to, to understand what it means.
to the degree that we can. We have to realize that, that in some cases it may be the imperial metric tool is the only lens as distorted and, and hiding as much as it does that we have. It may be. We have to be humble about our abilities to know and not try to understand more than we're capable of. So this brings us back to, uh, to the very beginning of the book where we talked about the nothingness of the atom, which then was used and is used by many to conclude that we're therefore nothing. And firstly, we should start, uh, we learned that we should start from what is more known and end in what is less known. Um, this relates to a story where a philosopher friend of mine was teaching this and one of the students was a science scientist, I think he was actually a graduate student, and, and he was telling him that atoms, you don't know atoms first, and he raised his hand and he said, well, that's not true. That's not the way scientists look at it. You know atoms first. Of course you don't, but it just shows the ingrained, how you can get in a groove by being taught something over and over again. It remains true that we learn about things by our senses. We cannot directly sense an atom. So we must and do learn about them indirectly. So what about, are we mostly nothing? Well, mostly nothing itself is an imperial metric concept that begs to be interpreted ontologically. When I say my grass is mostly green, what do I mean? I mean that there's some amount of grass on my lawn and some fraction of it, large, the largest fraction, is green and the rest is some other color, probably brown. So I'm saying, identifying some fraction of the existing whole is green. There's no way to do this with being. One cannot say a fraction of some, something that is, isn't. Everything that is, is. There's no fraction of it that isn't. Because non-being is not a part of something. Non-being, again, nothing is a being of reason. Hence, properly speaking, one should say that the ad if the atom is nearly nothing, and then just supposing many things that are nearly nothing does not give something uh, qualitatively different. This should be qualitatively different. Because if you have, we saw that, that qualities, you can't add qualities and get something different. You can't add uh, the one mediocre mathematician and get another mediocre mathematician and think you have twice as good of a mathematician. You don't. You could add as many as you want and you'll never get a Gauss or an Euler. And, you know, that's sort of a live demonstration because if that were true, then the whole world we would be getting the results of Gauss and Euler many times over because the population is so huge, and we don't. So does man equal a stack of atoms? If he is nothing more than what each atom is individually, then that's what he is. He's qualitatively just an atom, like an atom. If a man is not a unity, not one thing, just a stack of atoms, he is nothing better than the individual atoms. Stacking them up will not make any difference. There's nothing to sneak in, and we'll see what I mean by that in a second. Remember, you cannot add qualities. One can get from one quantity and a different quantity, a third different quantity. You can't do that with qualities. The first accident of things is quantity. Qualities are what calls, allows for relations among things. Qualities, for example, the, the redness of this apple. Imperiometric tendencies are strong. Indeed, we saw that Newton was strongly criticized because he introduced a quality, not just a quality, but an occult, what's so-called occult quality, because he introduced gravity, this thing that act, allows a relationship between things such that things get pulled to the ground. And this is an invisible quality. You know, they can't see the gravity. Now, when uh, the point that's often overlooked here is that if these atoms were really inert, the way some is sometimes thought by non-scientists, then they couldn't stack because you have to have a quality. If I have two things and there is no quality, then uh, the only quantitative aspects, they should be able to go right through each other because there is no quality to resisting um, one going into the other. Of course, that's absurd because that would not be a material thing. Um, indeed, the quantities would not be separate quantities once they're stacked on top of each other. So there must be at least some minimal quantities, uh, quality to make the stacking possible. And so this leads us to 
it's an important uh, historical note. De Democrates is often credited with thinking of the atom. But indeed, he thought of the atom as this inert thing, which is an absurd idea. And Aristotle was um, critical of this part of Democrates' thinking, realizing that the idea of an inert, unbreakable atom, which is what atom means, by the way, indivisible, and they thought some of the people that, when atoms came, uh, started coming up, thought that atoms were these things that Democrates thought they were. That is indivisible. Which we know now, of course, that they're far from indivisible. They can be broken up in lots of different ways. So, uh, reduction, re reductionism, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about saying that man is just the atoms that make him up, it, we have to recognize that in, in the imperiometric science that it's helpful. It facil facilitates building new models and finding new quantitative relations, but it is untenable to use it as ontology. We've already seen that. A man cannot be understood just by understanding an isolated atom, whatever that might mean. Indeed, what does an isolated atom mean? Because in order to understand it, you have to let it act on something to see what it does. So an isolated atom really makes no sense. Indeed, it is more impossible to do this, to try and understand man by an isolated atom, than it is to understand a sentence by means of the isolated words, or to understand a symphony by means of the isolated notes. Well, more impossible, well that's nonsense because uh, more impossible is impossible. Adding the adjective more makes no difference to the impossibility of it. Uh, indeed, this is the error of reducing quality to quantity. That's part of the reason I did it. But the other part of the reason was to show you that there is a real difference between the case of man and his atoms and the book and the words in the book. With man, we are dealing with a real ontological unity, not a unity based on signs. Remember that notes on a, in a symphony and letters in a word and words in a sentence and sentences in a book are signs that are one thing, but they refer to an external reality. Um, man is different. He is the interior, there's an interior unity of the thing. The book is a sort of accidental unity. The, the, the page here is referring to another reality in the mind. And so I can sneak things in. I can take this word away, but I can kind of sneak it back in and then see what it means. And I can kind of do that in my mind. You, there's not, no way to sneak anything in the case of man. If you're just saying that all there is is an isolated atom that's inert, then there's, there, that's all there is. There's nowhere and no, no place anything else to sneak in. Man, obviously, we saw, because we knew this before we knew about atoms, that man is a lot greater than a stack of atoms. He's a lot more, infinitely more than a stack of atoms, in fact, because of his immaterial substantial form. So what's the resolution of the dilemma? Ma matter of fact, before I go into that, let me note that even animals and plants and inanimate substances are more than, than what you would get of just thinking of this idealization of an isolated atom. Um, so the resolution of the dilemma is that atoms are neither inert or unbreakable. They are secondary matter that can receive a higher form. When atoms, say, for example, a silicon, which is what's used in most semiconductors, the chips in this camera that's recording me right now, for example, use silicon. When they come together under the right conditions, they create a crystal, which creates qualitatively different behavior qualitatively different situation than the isolated silicon atoms. Changes occur, acts, potentiality is reduced to act by the coming together of the silicon under the right conditions. And this is an inanimate substance. Indeed, again, we could not even know anything about an atom unless we were to do such things as congeal crystals like silicon. When we construct an imperiometric theory of atoms, we use measurements from di many different types of experimental setups and study atoms in many different chemical settings, i.e. in different substances. In this way, as we've said, we leave behind the qualities as they really are and replace them with a mathematical system and beings of reasons or models to interpret this system. 
So many different actualities and potentialities can be going on and they're represented by maybe one variable in an equation. And um, both the atom and the things used to probe it are included in the imperiometric theory in a hidden way. And don't forget that often there's this effect of averaging where you don't look at the individual, you don't look at the form per se, you look at well, this one had that, that one had this, and you kind of take an average. So no one of them has what you're talking about. Just sort of this non-existent average has the property. So let's look at the history of the atom to kind of see how this evolved and get a little bit of perspective on this sort of uh, main line, uh, this sort of representative problem. This is a problem that's representative of all the other problems. Uh, you know, what we've do, done here is kind of what we did in Chapter 7 with the inertia, Big Bang Theory, evolution. We're now doing it for the atom. And uh, it, it can represent all such cases because it's so well known. And is actually, the, the root of the problem came early, very early on with Democrates. And so it, it, it uh, in, historically, can be thought of as the, the, the roots of the problem. So in... in uh, 19, in 1766, in this time range of 66 to 1864, John Dalton uh, started doing some experiments where he found that the reactants and products, that uh, all the elements combine in such a way that there's whole number ratios between the, them. And he was explained this result, well, there must be some hidden thing in there that's a constant during these chemical reactions. Uh, gradually, evidence confirmed the ato atomic hypothesis built up towards the end of the 1800s and the, by the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, but still it hadn't convinced. By the end of the 1800s, there were still a lot of skeptics. It still wasn't completely convincing to people. They thought it was just um, a, uh, a being of reason. Rutherford uh, found the, the structure of the atom then in the 19, uh, later in the, in the early 1900s, by shooting alpha particles at a gold, gold film and noting that some of them shot right back at him. And that led him to understand that the nucleus was much more dense than the rest of the atom. And this is how we got our picture of the atom as having a dense part and then having huge amounts of less dense parts all the way out to an edge where we said if you had a basketball in the center, there'd be the edge of the atom would be two miles away. Um, so, but bef before we uh, talk about that structure of the atom more, uh, we, you should read in the book, by the way, how we make the distinction about what those experiments mean. Again, we don't actually see the alpha particle. We don't actually see the gold. We just see the results of the experiment, which are flashes on the film. But l let me continue the history. And I think in, for this sort of brief history, the culmination of this happened in the late 70s when a group of physicists actually, quote unquote, saw an atom. And there was an ion of barium. And what they had done is they had made it so that you could walk up and just look through a lens and you could look in there and what you saw was a bright blue light. It looked like a, apparently like a st blue star. Um, well, did they actually see the atom in the sense of being able to say, oh, there's an atom? Well, no, and you can see that in the following way. And that is, if you pick up his instrument, let's say you walk in the room and here's the instrument, and you look through the instrument and you walk in there and there's the blue dot, what will you say? You'll say, oh, there's a blue dot. You won't say, oh, there's an atom, because what you have to do is then you have to take all the experimental evidence, including what they've done in that experiment, to say that this is really that thing that when you put it together with other things makes these things makes up tables and chairs and people and so on. So you have this being of re this be this being that you're trying to test whether it's a real being or a being of reason and that's not resolved directly by your senses. You have to rely on the whole network of theory and experiment. So it's not an immediate sensation, it's a deduction based on the whole depending on the rightness of all the other deductions. It brings it to the level of a virtual certainty. But we have to make a sharp distinction between proper knowledge and improper knowledge. What can we say about atoms besides the fact that they're the smallest unit of an element? 
What qualities do they have, for example? Well, there's electromagnetic interactions between electrons. And now, again, we're talking about um, beings that we don't know their status. So they could be beings of reason. Right now, we have to consider them as beings of reason because we haven't um, done the ontological work to figure out what they are. But let's just use this as a name. There's some interaction going on between the electrons in the, sh in the distance between, in the long distance between the electron and the nucleus, if you consider how small the nucleus is and how big the atom is. But if you consider how small the atom is relative to us, it's a short distance. Th there's something in between there that allows the alpha particle to go through. It doesn't mean there's nothing between there. Indeed, the, electromagnetic, the electric and magnetic fields um, in a very simple uh, ontological interpretation are there and acting in between. And that's what makes them be able to communicate back and forth, electron to nucleus. And this is backed up by the more modern theory, the, what Richard Feynman was responsible for, of quantum electrodynamics, which says that there are fluctuations in, of this electromagnetic field. So there's constantly things going on in between in this quote-unquote nothing part of the atom. And this is verified by the fact of the so-called Lamb shift, whereby there's a shift in energy of light emitted because of these fluctuations affecting how the electron interacts. And so proper use of philosophy on the imperiometric tool belies even the idea that there's nothing between, in an atom, between the edge of the atom and the nucleus. Isolated atoms are more than unsophisticated, onto, are more than our unsophisticated ontological translation of the imperiometric implied. Atoms interact to form substances. In this state, the atoms are present, but we introduce a new concept now, virtually. They're virtually present. They are there, but to a less, in a lesser state, in a lesser mode, in a lesser actuality. They're not fully in act as the uh, substance of which they are a part is. They are subsumed into the more full actuality of the substance. For example, we show the film again of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas combining through the heat by the explosion to create water again. The, the, the hydrogen and oxygen become virtually present in the water. And you can see that because the properties of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas are radically different than the property of water. I wouldn't try to breathe water. I wouldn't try um, to do much near hydrogen. Similarly, water absorbed by a plant is subsumed, it becomes virtually existent in the plant. The plant is not one thing, it's one thing, not a thousand or ten to the so many different things within it, it's not the water and the, and the uh, nitrogen and all the different um, compounds in it, it's a sub individual substance that has these things virtually existing in it. The reality of the plant subsumes and uses the material reality of those other things. In the same way we, uh, we can say that the 10 to 28 atoms in man that we calculated before on, based on a simple calculation are virtually present in the actuality that is man. They're present at a lower level of actuality. Remember, reality, being, is heterogeneous. It's multivalent, having multiple layers. Atom is in an animal. The atom in an animal is an act in a lesser degree so that it can be a part of a larger thing, part of a substance, which is the animal. Once stripped off, if I gra you know, go like this and knock a whole bunch of atoms off, those atoms floating out are no longer subsumed and they take on their own substantial existence. And again, to note the difference, you saw, you know, the gas you can't even see of hydrogen and oxygen. Whereas the water, under the same temperature conditions, is visible. And, it, you know, you can pour it in a glass and drink it and so on. So you can tell there's a radical difference 
that takes place when these potentialities are reduced to actuality and the virtual presence of those things is subsumed under a larger um, uh, existent thing. So the virtual, this uh, noticing the, the concept of virtual, using the concept of virtual helps us understand um, the nothingness and the atom paradox. That the atom takes on a new level of being when present in a man or even a, 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 any substance. Protect, potentialities are actualized in, that the atom has are actualized when they're part of a man that aren't actualized when it's floating around somewhere. The form of the man is something qualitatively different from that of an isolated atom, which is what we already knew. We have to keep that in mind. We're coming back, we're trying to understand what the specialized science means, but we already knew it by direct knowledge. And so we're, it's, this, it's this root versus sort of the back door root, and we just understood how the two roots work. So, philosophy saves us from many deadly mistakes, uh, like the nothingness of the atom, which can make us think that we're nothing. But we study it for more than just that reason. We study it because that's what we're made for. We're made for truth. Philosophy, remember, philo, love, sophia, wisdom, love of wisdom, is the love of truth. Philosophy's uniqueness in the sense that it's unlike mathemati mathematics, at least as it's currently practiced, it, it, it's not simply working within a more or less predefined mental framework. It's conforming oneself to reality, seeking the real at its depth. As such, it requires one to stay, wait, and listen. It takes a contemplation, a stillness, to do philosophy. Philosophy is a meditation on reality that, by which you come to understand it. Empirological scientists as it's sometimes practiced, actually as it's often practiced, can sometimes be a substitution of action for thinking. These differences along with our somewhat impatient cultural tendencies, we have to have our fast food and everything else like that, partly explain the, the widespread ignorance of philosophy because you can't get it fast. You have to get it at the speed that you can process it, which means staring, listening, absorbing. But why, the, in general, is there this ignorance? What's the, the primary reason why the science before science is so neglected? Uh, the formerly self-professed pagan and renowned philosopher that I already mentioned, Mortimer Adler, was on TV not so long ago, and Adler was asked this question. Um, why is it that so few men know philosophy? Or, and make these rather fundamental mistakes. And Adler shook his head and he kind of bowed his head and he said, and he, he looked really pained and, and said something like, you know, I have to say something really unkind here. They just haven't submitted their minds to the literature. And what he meant by that is the literature of St. Thomas and his disciples. They haven't been still before the, the reality and the people that have learned from it. So we see that the science before science is indeed so, we deny it at the peril of the second science, modern science, and of our own happiness.